But I will tell you, the whole time I'm screaming at the top of my lungs after we lost so many lives, and I could have saved hundreds, but we couldn't get people to act. And I'm screaming as loud as I can the entire time. If we don't do something, it's coming here. And you know what they'd all tell me? From the Reagan building in Washington to the agency to DIA headquarters, Jason, as long as that shit stays in Mexico, how does that impact us? But it wasn't. This is 2013 in Stark County. What you're looking at is a light anti-tank weapon that the Zetas dug into the ground because as we would battle them in Mexico, they would jump into the river, cross into the U.S., and then be able to dig these weapon systems up. This has been going on far too long, ladies and gentlemen. People ask me all the time, are the cartels here? They are everywhere here, tens of thousands of them. But Jason, as long as it stays in Mexico, they tell me. So I'm sitting as a captain at headquarters when one of my lieutenants and one of my agents walks in my office and says, hey, Captain, we got a problem. There's been a murder in South Lake, Texas. And I said, well, why is that a problem? We have murders all the time. And they said, because the FBI, the DEA, and the HSI are all on scene. I said, okay, oh, shit, we got a problem. What is it? Get up there. Local ranger identified that an individual who was a source for the federal government and was a Gulf Cartel lawyer had been hiding in the South Lake, Texas area for a very long time. But El Gato, who was a leader within the Beltran Leva organization who held a grudge against this individual, wanted him. And he spent over the course of months up to a million dollars to locate him. What they didn't tell you in the news is that a cell of the Beltran Leva organization had been putting tracking devices on vehicles linked to family all over the country from as far as Florida. And for months, they finally located him. And when he pulled up to a mall with his wife and he parked, they jumped out and they shot 10 rounds into him and executed him with precision. We knew very quickly who was responsible and we have known where El Gato has been for years. He's been on the Texas, uh, excuse me, the FBI's top 10 most wanted and we couldn't get the federal government to act. I want you to know that in Mexico, the United States government has known the house he has been in since May of this year. You know why we just arrested him? Think of it. We got a video Guzman in one week and we got this guy in the same week, right before the president of the United States went to Mexico. It's shameful what has been happening. But Jason, as long as it stays in Mexico, they kept telling me. And I'm screaming, and I'm screaming, we've got to act. And then I'm sitting there in my office one morning, and my lieutenant comes in and he says, we've got a problem, the ranger in Brownsville just called. We've got a body with no head in it. It's been gutted from the chest down to the navel. It's floating in the intercoastal. I said, yeah, that's a problem. They want help. They think it's cartel related. Within four hours, we had identified the location here where they did the murder. The victim had been stealing small amounts of cocaine from cocaine loads he'd been putting in tires. He was shot in the head, decapitated, and the source told us that it was in this tire shop. We ran a search warrant, and with Luminol, we were able to determine that was exactly where it took place. The head supposedly has never been found, but it was taken to Mexico. But the problem wasn't there. The problem was that this individual that committed the crime was a U.S. Border Patrol agent. Wait, it gets better. He's also an illegal alien. <laughs> you see, another thing the federal government never wanted you to know, because he had gone into the U.S. military with fake documents, and when he was hired as a Border Patrol agent, this guy had access to every one of Texas's sensors and every one of the Border Patrol sensors and had been given them to the Gulf Cartel. When the, when the warrant was executed on his residence, we found a Gulf Cartel pistol in his, in his uh, safe, along with some heroin, and I think it was about $89,000 in U.S. currency. But Jason, as long as it stays in Mexico, they keep telling me. And I'm screaming, and I'm crossing the country on my own dollar to anyone that would listen to me. As long as it stays in Mexico, 
autistic girl beheaded in Alabama. Finally, found somebody that gave a shit, Lara Logan. Anybody know Lara? An incredible journalist. She and I spent many, many days and months in Roma, Texas, trying to capture what was happening at your border. And in 2020, this is what we captured. This lasted an hour and a half in Miguel Aliman. There we go, record. It's 4 a.m. on the southern border in Texas in the tiny town of Roma. Listen to that. This is what I've been trying to warn about. Another day at the border. We'd arrived with counterterrorism specialist Jason Jones to find war raging on America's doorstep. Oh, there you go. There, there's a 40. Did you hear the 40? Yes. That was 40 a 40-millimeter grenade. That was a grenade, yeah. Yeah. It's in real, isn't it? Yeah. Right here on the border. Oh, there's the 40. That's the 40 millimeter. Oh, and there's the. So this is three nights in a row, yeah? This is the fourth day of back to back gun battles that Border Patrol has heard these things and reported them in for four days straight. Yesterday they had a gun battle at noon, same location where we're reporting from here. The day before that, they had two uh, large explosions, which they believed were grenades going off like what we just heard. Lara Logan is an incredible woman. Incredible what she has done to try to illuminate what has been happening on that border. I was sure that when that went out, that would go absolutely viral and something would happen. And like always, again, nothing from the executive leadership of the Homeland Security Enterprise. For me, I don't care if you're left, right, up or down, but when you're in a leadership position within law enforcement, at the highest levels, and you're an executive, and you have the ability at a phone call to fix these problems, and you do nothing, this is exactly why I attack them on national television all the time. But Jason, as long as it stays in Mexico, what you're gonna see is now what's known in Texas as the Hebronville incident. We got this from a SIM card. U.S. Border Patrol shared this with me so that we could get it out to the American people. And I want you to see the tactics that we see in Mexico now 80 miles into the U.S. as they were moving a high value who we believe was a cartel boss or at least ranking member. And I want you to look at the dash cam and, or up on the dash and you're going to see a light bar just like they have in Mexico. You're going to look at the, wep the weaponry system they're carrying and they're, they're smuggling people. This is the change that has happened along the southwest border in Texas. What they're about to do is meet up with another vehicle. Everyone's going to deploy out. They're going to jump and they're going to do what we call leapfrogging from one vehicle to the next. Most of these pickup trucks are stolen from San Antonio, Texas. Houston and Dallas are taken to the border and converted for smuggling or into armored vehicles. But I want you to look how he gets out. Ready to take on law enforcement or ranchers. We literally have a state highway right behind them right there where this handoff occurred. Ah, but Jason, they just keep telling me. As long as that stays in Mexico, and I know you're thinking, here we are in Phoenix. I'm sure glad that was Texas. Well, let me show you what's happening here. What you're seeing is a 50 caliber Barrett. And if you look to the right, you see an Arizona state trooper vehicle. You're looking at Interstate 10. This was posted on social media by this group, believed to be Sinaloans, because everything here, by the way, all of the plazas on the mic side are controlled by the Sinaloa cartel. Your impact here for ground zero for deadly fentanyl is a direct result of the Sinaloa cartel. They produce more deadly fentanyl than any other cartel in Mexico. But look at the trade craft that's now here. And look how as they pass not one but two state troopers. They do not care. Guy's got several Glocks. If you look down to his left hand, he's got an SKS or an AK-47 and along with an M4. And ask yourself, why are you not being told? 
There's many reasons for it, and I'm going to share those with you here shortly. They don't fear them. The reason they're carrying the 50 is they're not looking to shoot the state trooper with the 50. They're looking to disable vehicles chasing them with, the, with that uh, 50 caliber. That's why it doesn't even have a scope on it. It's very common in Mexico. But Jason, as long as this just stays in Mexico, we broke this just a few weeks ago through the great work of MSG. It's a security group here, close friends of mine who are willing to go to the border for six months. We have monitored to just show you how broken our Homeland Security Enterprise has begun, become. For six months, we have been documenting this on national news, the rise of a cartel base run by the El Chap Chapito's cell. 300 meters from your border south of Aravaca, Arizona. This one finally went viral, finally, due to the great work of our film crew that went out working with MSG. The miners, oh, he's telling the guy to look. Is that the top of the flat mountain? Yeah. So that's two Pitos people. Yep. He's got a rifle with him too. They launched a drone, oh, he and shoot. then they started shooting he's at shooting it. Shooting at it. Yeah. Rounds coming into the United States. Oh, there you go. Shot fired. He's getting ready to fire. Did he fire? Yeah, he was shooting. He's still shooting. They're talking to somebody. Someone else is. Oh, there we go. That guy's shooting. Him. There we go. Nah, but Jason, as long as it stays in Mexico, what you're seeing here, I just shake my head. I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. For those of us who are older, we remember when the overdose death crisis in this country in the 80s from the crack epidemic, we remember that. That was a big deal in the problem with drugs in, in this country in the 80s. Look at where we were. This is from the Center of Disease Control. This is their data going back since it started in the 60s. Look at the rise. There are two major tripwires of failure of the United States intelligence agencies, and I hammer them till the end of time because they've done nothing to illuminate this. There were major shifts that took place in the poisoning of Americans, and it started right here in 2015. This is when P2P began, began being shipped by China into Mexico to the Sinaloa cartel. Methamphetamine, the creation of some of the most powerful meth that we're seeing. They have taken over the market of methamphetamine. In the old days, our street gangs controlled it. Small cooks controlled meth in this country. Today, there's not a tier one gang, a U.S.-based street gang, all of it. They're buying from the cartels. And this was the major tripwire as the Chap uh, Chapo Guzman and his cell of the Sinaloans began importing meth in unprecedented numbers that we had seen. And you can see the rise. But there was another one, too, in 2015 when they adjusted to fentanyl. Because, see, when they adjusted to fentanyl in 2015, this was for the first time when U.S. Customs and Border Protection sees 70 pounds at the southwest border for the first time. During, for, a, for a year. And look at what happened afterward. All you had to do was look at the data for what was coming. And when you talk to these cartel members and when you were debriefing them, they would tell you, we're out of control. The American government has to step in. They know they're out of control when you talk to them. They'll tell you. But they can't stop it. And it's resulted in so many families being destroyed. One of the reasons that we have failed tremendously in this country is a direct result the failed leadership of the Federal Bureau of Investigation at the highest levels. The Uniform Crime Report System, known as UCR, everything I've talked to you about today is not captured. Murder, manslaughter, forcible rape, robbery, aggravated robbery, burglary, theft, motor vehicle theft, and you say to yourself, well, hell, that kind of covers it, right? That's what our data collection is in the United States. Now, let me show you what's not been captured, and that's everything I've shared with you today. Public corruption, kidnapping, 
extortions, drug trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, how is a nation for 60 years been in a supposed drug war and amongst 18,000 agencies, we can't tell you as the public how much narcotics is seized in this country every year because we've had a failed system. You see, we say it's Republicans, we say it's Democrats. Sometimes if you don't get the little things right, you're never going to get the big things right. How are we funding these agencies when we don't even recognize the impact from transnational crime? And so what do you hear? You hear from the left and the right that it's this and it's that. And at the end of the day, the system doesn't even capture it. So now they went to a new one, they call it. They call it their new system, by the way. I love this. It's called NIBRS, National Incident-Based Reporting. And it captures 52 new index crimes. But you know how many agencies are using it? About 40%. And of that, they're not all reporting. So you have a system in this country that is a complete failure to really show you the evolution and the impact of transnational crime. And that's why you have had for decades families, ranchers, people along the southwest border saying, we've got problems, we've got problems. You've had governors. And in the north, we're saying, we hear you, but we don't see it because the data doesn't show it. Nobody was lying. The problem is you weren't told. Now this is where we find ourselves. And then I'm going to close with this. This is what I call the convergence, where we are so impacted now with transnational crime, we have things going south. One thing that sticks in my mind is a stop the chief deputy made. It was two individuals, young man and young woman. And uh, turns out he was transporting her to the border to sell her for $10,000. He was gonna traffic her. They had been on the road for 16 hours from up north and she just got in too deep, didn't know how to get out until my deputy made that stop. He saved her life. Absolutely. And had my chief not stopped her 80 miles from the border, she would have disappeared. She's gonna graduate from high school this year because of him. It's great work. It's great police work. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to close here with something. And I want to speak to every mother and father for a second, every angel family, every rancher who has been through so much for so long. I have talked to you all across this country. I've talked to you from Nebraska to Washington. I've talked to you here in Phoenix, all along that southern border in Texas. I'm on that border every other week. And one thing that is always common it's the common theme that I hear, and that is that your government has abandoned you. And it's absolutely true. You are the forgotten Americans. But I want to tell you something, and I truly mean this to the very core of who I am. You are not forgotten. There are those of us like Tom Homan, Victor Avila, Mark Morgan, Derek Maltz, who are united. We are on every front trying to illuminate what is happening, and we are fighting like hell to, to show it to you. But I also want to say this. What these cartels have done and been able to get away with is unacceptable. And I hope they're watching right now, and I'm sure there are many of them that are. We are building a coalition, and they have two years, and then we are coming for them. And I will tell you, these wrongs are going to be righted. And I'm so sorry for what your families have gone, to, gone through. But Americans, Mexicans, and people all over the world are being impacted by these cartels, and we are going to get this fixed. We are going to get this fixed, and we're coming for them. God bless you. Thank you all for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, come here for a minute. Jason, one quick question. Jason Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Jason, does uh, Alejandro Mayorkas understand this stuff? Does he know about this? Alejandro Mayorkas is not only briefed, on the highest classification levels in this country. But every time on national television, he tells you your border is safe, your border is secure, he is lying to you. And that's why I go to the border and I show it to you because if I talk about it, but when I show you the videos of what they're doing and I'm there on the ground, I show you the proof of what's really happening.